I have talked many times about Matthew Franklin Whittier as an undercover agent for the cause of abolition, anti-slavery agent. And uh, very recently, I mentioned that he wrote a scathing expose of a slavery auction that he had crashed for the Boston Chronotype. <clears throat> so today I'm going to share that with you. Uh, I hopefully won't take too long. I'm going to read these three pieces uh, in their entirety and comment on them briefly. Uh, but I do have to kind of set the stage. Now, the first thing is to read from a hypnotic regression, my first of two hypnotic regression sessions when I was investigating my past life as Matthew Franklin Whittier. This took place on October 28, 2008. And um, I say, I can't describe what I felt when I saw that slave market. I can't describe what I felt when I saw that slave market. But it, I can't think of the right word, hatred. I felt such hatred for those people that were doing that. I don't know precisely what scene it was, whether somebody was being separated from their loved one or their families, or, but I, I saw the fear in those people and I saw what they were doing. And it, it, I, I was filled with such, uh, I can't, I don't have a word for it, but whatever it was, that was enough. That one experience was enough, you know. I'm sorry? So the reward for you is what? I think it was not really, really, it was hatred for the slave owners. It was to, to, to ruin them, to disable them, to bring them down as much as it was to help the slaves. It was the hatred I felt for those people, that I was going to destroy them with anything that I had, which was my mind and my ability to write. Now, that was, that was directly from my feelings. That was not necessarily, certainly from the spiritual point of view, and I've been a spiritual aspirant for many, many years. That was not the right attitude, you know, but I said what came from my heart. That was what I felt. And what's behind the scenes in this is when we get into this slave auction, we'll find that he talks about a young woman who's just about the age that Abby was when he fell in love with her, 15, 16, or something like that. See, So he's identifying that young girl, that young woman, with Abby, who had passed on some years earlier. But to him, that was Abby being sold into sexual slavery, basically. And that was what the hatred was coming from as much as anything else, I think. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Now, I want to look at the logistics of this thing, because these three articles appear in the Boston Chronotype of June 19, 1848, July 4, 1848, and July 12, 1848. Um, so uh, could Matthew have actually gone to the slave auction and written this? Well, we know because Matthew was writing very regularly to the editor of the Boston Chronotype, his friend, Elijah Wright, who was a abolitionist, from New York City as XFW. He'd just taken his initials and changed them from MFW to XFW, and he wrote very frequently and he would date his letters, so we know when he was in New York City. And uh, there's a gap of about a week from uh, May 18 to May 25. And then uh, I read for you not too long ago Matthew's story in the Daily Delta, where he was freelancing for uh, the summers of 1846 and 1847, and then briefly in 1848 apparently, um, about the Piscatorian Brotherhood, which were, that was code for the fishers of men, which is to say he was meeting with the Underground Railroad around New Orleans, as I take it. Well, that was published in the Daily Delta of June 1st. 
So we have this gap from May 18 to May 25. Then comes in the Daily Delta, this Piscatorian Brotherhood on June 1st. And then we have a number of letters from XFW, June 3rd, June 7, June 10, June 15. And then comes the first graphomania on June 19, and then July 4 and July 12. That suggests that Matthew was down in the New Orleans area meeting with members of the Underground Railroad, and they got him into a slave auction uh, sometime between May 18 and May 25, 1848. So that's the logistics of the thing. Now we're going to turn to the actual pieces. I know definitely that this is Matthew Franklin Whittier by style. And there's one smoking gun in it, which tells us that indeed it was Matthew. When we get to that, I will show you. So here's the first one of June 29, 1848. I'm going to bring it up on my Kindle, but I've got a, a photographic copy. It's going to be a little blurry, but I've got a photographic copy that I can put up on the screen for you. This is in the Boston Chronotype of June 29, 1848. This is a series, and I've told you that Matthew would start little series, like the Piscatorian Brotherhood was supposed to be a series, and it was a series of one, right? Because uh, apparently he got found out or something and bugged out. This is a series called Facts and Imaginings, and this is number one. It's by Graphomania, which means somebody that like compulsively writes, basically. It's called the Slave Mart at New Orleans, and there's a quote, and I haven't looked this up. I will look it up if I can find it. I will put it on the screen for you. And thus they plod in sluggish misery, rotting from sire to son and age to age. And then he begins, I, this is going to be kind of long, but I feel like this is important. So you can take the cursor and move forward if you need to. Our patience is fairly exhausted by hearing the sentimental whine about the institution of slavery, which should not only be tolerated, but for the sake of benevolence, be supported. Bah! Mrs. Humbug, what do you know about slavery, save from the look at your cousin George Washington Froth's footman, and you, Miss Clementine Angelina Snooks, but from the gentle attentions of your Aunt Belinda's waiting maid? Now note the bah humbug, okay, just as a passing mentioned. This is 1848, five years after Christmas Carol was published. Talk not to us of the kind care of a rich and an independent southerner to his slaves. If you would see slavery in all its hideous blackness, go into the midst of it. Look at it in all its phases and bearings. Talk with the man dwarfed into the brute. Count his privileges, weigh his opportunities, and measure the span of his existence. After you have comprehended the individual, the unit, multiply it into the millions, and then stand and gaze long and seriously upon the lowering curse that lies over our land. This is Matthew Franklin Whittier's prose. A few weeks since, while lounging away a summer's morning in the rotunda of the St. Charles at New Orleans, the advertisement of a sale of slaves caught our eye. Now, I think this was actually a private auction, if I'm not mistaken. I tried to track it down, and I, there was a private auction that matches this. 100 plantation slaves, the property of a gentleman forced to sell them to raise money to meet the payment of his notes, then coming due in the city. The whole to be sold to the highest bidder without reserve. We had already in our southward course looked upon the slave toiling doggedly at his unrequited labor. We had seen him scarred and maimed by the lash. We have beheld the stern glance of hate and heard the muttered threat as he bowed grudgingly to his servitude. We had even walked several miles through Gravier Street and wonderingly peered into all the warehouses where the human animal is fattened, gaudily decked out, and exposed for private sales. He's talking about the private sales, which I think this one was. We had oftentimes even made, see, if he had admitted he'd gone to a private auction, then the question is immediately who got him into it, and then those people could have been in trouble. We had oftentimes even made pretense of purchase for the opportunity of asking questions and getting at the thought that we knew to be teeming madly under the immovable muscle of the Eben visage. 
In other words, he pretended to want to buy a slave in order to interview them. So now we know that Matthew Franklin Whittier, the abolitionist, interviewed slaves in New Orleans. Let me read that again. We had oftentimes even made pretense of purchase for the opportunity to asking questions and getting at the thought that we knew to be teeming madly under the immovable muscle of the Eben, I don't know if it's pronounced Eben or Eben, visage. But here was a new spectacle. 100 men, women, and children were to be sold at public auction for money to pay notes with. At 12 o'clock precisely, the hour appointed, I was at Hewlett's Exchange, the place of sale. The area was already filled with the anxious purchasers with catalogs in their hands. Most of them seemed gentlemen planters in pursuit of slaves for their own use, but among these were several speculators, traffickers in human flesh, without the fear of God or devil before them. This class were conspicuous for their particular examination of the articles on sale. We noticed one hardened old sinner in particular. He had fixed his eye upon a young girl of some 15 or 16 summers. Now Matthew is seeing Abby in her place. She was of a beautiful rounded form and had the head and face of a Venus. She would have been a queen in her own sunny climate, clime, but here she must choke down her agony and tamely submit to insult. Open your mouth, you slut, sternly muttered the purchaser, and he suited the action to the words and thrust apart the lips and teeth of the girl. Sound teeth, eh? Can eat your full allowance of grub, I'll be bound. Then followed certain rubs and pinches upon her arms, shoulders, breast, and neck, such as a judicious horse jockey bestows upon the animal for which he is in treaty. We hoped for the sake of common decency, if from no other motive, that his examination would end here. But we were disappointed. That was Matthew's typical use of the word disappointed, by the way, an ironic use. I can cite many instances. He was not the man to purchase a commodity without fully understanding its value. Let's see your ankles, your knees. Up higher, you silly wench. This was too much for the poor girl. A faint blushing tinge crept under her dark skin and the tears started to her eyes, and this hardened criminal had a daughter of his own about the same age. What would have been his rage at the suggestion of the same process to his own daughter? Where is the difference? If any, the delicacy of character would probably preponderate in favor of this poor enslaved girl. But she is placed upon the platform, so far above the floor as to be conspicuous to all the house. The auctioneer possessed an indifference sufficiently brazen to have knocked down St. Paul himself to the highest bidder. Who bids? What's offered? Fine wench, rather delicate in appearance, little ticklish, shy at this age, came of a good stock, no doubt will be a good breeder. Come, come, bid away. Five hundred, five fifty, six, six fifty, eight hundred. Well done, sir, you have discovered her value. Eight, 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 eight hundred. Once, eight hundred twice, eight hundred dollars and gone. Well, Mr. Holdfast, you have got a rare bargain there. Hope I shall have the selling of the progeny. Don't let there be too many yellow ones, though. Them always hurts my feelings to sell. The misery of the poor black girl was now at the highest. She had fallen into the hands of the brutal speculator, and her fate could be imagined from the treatment already received from him. She continued in the position in which her natural gracefulness had at first thrown her, and such an eloquent expression of despair, depicted in her every form and feature, we never saw or imagined before. In the marked catalog before us, we find that Jane was sold to a Mr. Holdfast for $800. Mr. Holdfast takes his property and places it in a corner, evidently intending to add more to it in the course of the sale. A further account of this scene in our next. Now, my feelings are immediately accessible here. I still remember this emotionally, not cognitively. Matthew felt terrible guilt at being such a coward that he would not sacrifice his life, which no doubt he would have been, to rush forward and stop this asshole. You know, uh, he, he lived with this the rest of his life. This was a young girl like Abby or like his own daughter who was being sold into sexual slavery by this, to this brute, see? 
and he did nothing to stop it. Not that he could have done anything, but I feel terrible guilt about this. This is why he wrote this piece to atone for the guilt that he felt at not being able to do anything. Now that was June 29, 1848. Now, I hope you understand why Matthew Franklin Whittier in 1845, this is only three years later, did not publicly come forward to challenge Edgar Allan Poe's false claim to the Raven. He was deeply connected with the Underground Railroad. I'm not just blowing this off when I say that as an excuse. Matthew was deeply connected with the Underground Railroad in New York City and other places. He could not come forward publicly. Okay? So please put to rest the idea that I'm just using that as an excuse and imagining it. And of course, he could have disputed it. He could not have. Um, let's go to the July 4, 1848 edition. This is the second installment. Facts and Imaginings, number two, by Graphomania, the slave mart at New Orleans. Now we have another quote. If I can find this, I will post it. So spake the fiend, and with necessity the tyrant's plea excused his devilish deeds. And he writes, The hundred slaves were huddled together near the auctioneer's platform, where one by one they were successively to pass under the hammer. The men sat in stoical silence. Matthew is a stoic philosopher, remember. The women, especially such as were mothers, gazed in anxious grief upon their little ones as they playfully grouped themselves upon the floor at their feet. The children that but a short time since had been pressed to the mother's bosom with all the earnest yearnings that none but a mother's heart can feel were to be sold and separated away to cruel servitude, never more to know the endearments of a maternal love. All the ties of consanguinity and friendship were here to be severed for life and the miserable objects to be sent from the place where all their happy associations had clustered away to the fever and egg swamps of Mississippi or to the barbarous cotton fields of upper Texas. And such an outrage upon humanity was to be perpetrated in an open daylight in a Christian city and witnessed, yes, sanctioned by hundreds of witnesses. One could hardly realize the atrocious fact. Here in the freest country on earth and in the 19th century was a scene transpiring that would have disgraced the times of Nero or Caligula. It is no dream of fiction, it is too real, and yet no avenging hand is put forth to stay the outrage. The work goes on. The next two victims are a noble middle-aged man and his wife, who called herself 22. They were not to be sold together, for they would not bring so much money as if sold separate, and moreover it seems the design of everyone who has anything to do with slaves to discourage and deaden all the domestic loves to which human nature is addicted. The young wife was first questioned in this manner, that she might perchance recommend herself. How old are you? Twenty-two. How long have you been married? Three years. How many children have you? None. And as she made the last reply in a saddened tone, the tears started from her eyes, and she turned beseechingly to her husband for protection. Upon this, the questioner, too, turns ferociously towards him. You villain, you, have you lived three years with this wench without having any children? Now the true man was seen, although bound in fetters and trampled in the dust, with form erect and folded arms, and with a dignity that might have lent luster to Othello himself, he calmly replies, We have had one, but God took him. The fact that the woman had been the mother of but one child, and that dead, was the reason for the low price of $200 for which she was knocked down. She was purchased by a Red River planter to be turned out into the fields to hoe and pick cotton. The husband was afterward sold for $750 to be sent into the swamps of Tennessee as a wood chopper. The two were separated never more to meet in this world. It is expected that husbands and wives thus separated will form new connections, rear up new families, and perchance be again sold and divided asunder. Thus are the holiest of the institutions of heaven rendered void by the management of men, and thus are poor ignorant slaves made to commit the sins that are denounced by all moral and civil law and by the direct commands of God. The last spectacle was as much as we could bear. 
We thought of our own deep domestic loves then 3,000 miles away. That's the smoking gun because Matthew's second family, Jane Vaughn, that was an arranged marriage. He couldn't live with her, but he had three children by her and he loved his children dearly. She came from St. John, Canada. She would frequently, when he was away, which he was away most of the time, because like I said, he couldn't live with her. He sent money back to support the family. She would often go back to her native St. John. It so happens that if you look at the distance between New Orleans and St. John, it's exactly 3,000 miles. So Matthew has signed this. It was a little bit bold of him to do that, but apparently he felt that he could get away with it, that nobody would know or nobody suspected him personally. So 3,000 miles away is Matthew Franklin Whittier's signature on this. The last spectacle was as much as we could bear. We thought of our own deep domestic loves then 3,000 miles away. The love and the sympathy of the wife so entwined into our own soul that no fate in time or eternity could separate the two whose separate existence had become one life. The clinging fondness of the little ones who will not be content with a separate existence, but insist upon being part of the parent still. We left the scene, but the anguish of that separated pair followed us. It has not ceased to follow us since. There was the memory of their little log house in the skirt of Cottonwood upon the riverside. There was the place of their early love, as they had been reared up together on their wealthy owner's plantation, from thence they had entered the precincts of the church, and before God and in the holy forms of the episcopacy, they had promised to take each other, quote, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness, in health, to love and to cherish, till death should part them according to God's holy ordinance. There was born to them their little boy who had gladdened their hearts, Matthew lost a son as well in infancy, and then died. And there hard by was his little grave over which they had wept together and would only be comforted in believing that God had taken him. In that last long lingering look was crowded the gathering reminiscences of all the happiness they had known in life. In closing this sketch, allow us to say that we have seen slavery in every form. We have conversed with slaves, slave owners, slave speculators, and those who would have nothing to do with slaves. Now, that means, again, that he has interviewed slaves. We have looked at it politically, morally, and religiously, and may hereafter give our views from each point of observation. We can only say now that it is difficult to comprehend the enormity of the evil, and that in the work of emancipation is required much care and consideration. If possible, the philanthropists of both North and South Notice he mentions philanthropists of the South because he has just recently met with them in the South. Of the whole country and the whole civilized world should work harmoniously together that the time may be hastened when slavery shall be no more. Now, I could go on and on about Matthew's work against slavery, his literary work. In 1855, he was the real author of The Rag Picker or Bound and Free, the second half of which deals with slavery in the Underground Railroad, which was lavishly praised by William Lloyd Garrison in his newspaper, The Liberator, and excerpted at length on two, in two different editions. That was not George Burnham. Uh, but there's much, much more that Matthew has, has published. But let's go to the last one, which is rather a surprise. He's, he's told us what he thought he was going to do but this is the third and last um, entry in this series, Facts and Imagining. So we'll read it. Forest Hills, and there is um, a quote. This is, this is Latin, more ultima linea rerum est, from Horace. And then it's translated. Methinks it were no pain to die on such an eve when such a sky or canopy the west. At least, I don't. maybe that's not a translation. So I don't know Latin. Matthew did. So I don't know what that means. Ultima linea. That sounds like the, the, the last, you know, the last end place or something, the last place you end up. All right. So this is about Forest Hills Cemetery in Boston. And um, <laughs> I'll go ahead and read it since I'm reading these. They're not really all that long. 
because at the end, he makes it clear that he's dedicating everything he just did and everything he just wrote, maybe his best anti-slavery work to date, he's dedicating it to Abby's memory. That's what this third one is. If you would, at a glance, learn the true character of a people, follow them to the resting places of their dead. It is there that a voice arises from the grave to commend or condemn. It will speak joyfully of a faith and hope beyond its precincts, or it will silently pronounce the fiat of eternal sleep and nothingness to all who pass its fearful portals. Such has ever been our impression, and most deeply did we feel its truth as we followed in the long winding procession after the consecrating dirge among the forest hills. It's in Boston. Thousands of persons had come out from their homes on one of the brightest days that ever beamed on earth, not to arrange and plan any new scheme of worldly ambition of profit or pleasure, but literally to view the places where ere long they were to lay their dear ones dead and after, quote, life's fitful fever, retire themselves there to rest. Men left their merchandise and women left their cares and duties of home, bow and bells, for the hour forgot the vanities of life. Graybeards and youth came together. It was a serious and earnest multitude that on that day thronged this newly discovered garden of nature's own forming. There's a dedication of Forest Hill Cemetery. As the softened tread fell upon the green sward after the sacred tones that resounded through those woodland aisles, our imagination would not be longer confined to detail, but reveled away in its own joyousness. Every break covered in its leafy enclosure the friendly fairy that doubtless has danced here unmolested upon the, quote, banks where the moonbeams sleep since creation's dawn. The naiads quietly retreated beneath the lily pads. Now, Matthew thought of Abby as a naiad, so that's a deliberate reference, I think. The naiads quietly retreated beneath the lily pads upon which they had frolicked before this strange insinuation into their own retreats. The whole wide empyrean of heaven floated the feathery cloud that imperceptibly formed the myriad angel faces to gaze approval down, while all the trees moved to the zephyr in soft unison as it played through their leafy boughs. If ever there was a time and place where spirits met and joined in a work with mortals, to do a deed approved by the good of earth and the very angels of heaven. That time was now, and the place was here. This is Matthew's writing. He's above, well above average reporter. The place was consecrated by the living to the dead. The portals of Nems at the southerly entrance would ever whisper of immortality to the ear, while their unchanging green depicted it to the eye. Quote, the willows would murmur their soft requiems as they danced their weeping branches over the dead. Quote, the bubbling fountain near was emblematic of that living water of which whosoever drinketh shall never thirst. These are all quotes apparently taken from the narrator, from the orator, excuse me. It was a speech given. So he's quoting these elements of the speech. He was a reporter and he, would, he knew shorthand, so he was probably taking down the whole thing. So all of these are quotes. The expression of the place away from the thoroughfares of busy life was emphatically rest. All tastes of mortals could be gratified here. There was the green mound already rounded. Here the quiet glen where the brooklet ripples. Yonder the ponderous granite cliff out of which tombs would yet be hewn. And the smooth glade nearby would be beautiful by graves. The good man would here wrap the drapery of death about him and lie down as to pleasant dreams. The bright flowers of spring would bloom over infant blossoms more beautiful than they. The withered leaves of autumn would rustle over those whose lives had been as brief. The squirrel's chirp and the wild wood's bird's note would continue to tell how unmolested was their home. The delicate and sensitive mourner could come here alone, unseen by the thoughtless, heartless world. In this place, let there be no art to improve nature, for true art always hides itself under nature's profuseness of beauty. In a place set apart forever like this, no municipal economy would ever offend by disturbing the ashes of the dead. When the spirit left for heaven, there was no unpleasant thought in leaving here the body to mingle quietly with this virgin earth. 
Such were the themes upon which the gifted orator eloquently discoursed. The large audience gathered there upon Consecration Hill hung upon his words and were enchained by them to the place, and never was more truthfully or feelingly sung than at the close of these ceremonies the beautiful hymn. I would not live all way, I ask not to stay, where storm after storm rises dark o'er the way. I would not live all way, no, welcome the tomb, since Jesus hath lain there, I dread not its gloom. That was one of Abby's favorite songs. And I'm going on some clues and some past life emotion, but I have two antiquarian volumes of music, which I believe were played by Abby. And the reason I believe that is back in the Dover Inquirer, I've shared this before, where Matthew and Abby eloped to, they wrote, or Matthew wrote for the paper, the Inquirer, and in that paper, there are people selling books. And I think Wadley, the editor, Mr. Wadley, it was George Wadley, also sold books. And one batch of books was music. Well, since the first batch of books, the other ones are titles that Matthew would have liked. And since these are music and Abby was musical, played piano and sang, I think those were hers. Those were the ones she liked. So from that, I went and bought two of them, antiquarian copies, and I started looking through. And I found, oh, five or six or seven between the two antiquarian volumes of sheet music that I recognized very, very strongly as the ones that Matt, that Abby used to play and that was their personal favorites. Well, one of them is I would not live all way, but I can't, even now, I can't really play it. I mean, it's too, it's too powerful for me. You know, uh, the, the feelings are too strong. Just like when I was a kid and I tried to read The Raven when it was assigned in sixth grade and I couldn't read it all the way through. What I remember is that after Abby died, if I happened to be somewhere and that thing was playing, I would bolt out of the room. I could not bear to hear it. Well, in this case, I couldn't very well get away. But this is the way that Matthew signs this third one, dedicating the first two about the slave auction to her memory. And the uh, way I'm going to close this, if I can, is to go to the piano. I'll have to reset up the camera, so I'll have to dip to black and come back up and play just the soprano part of the intro for this song, because it's a different tune than what you'll find if you look it up online. This is the one that was being sung, presumably at the funeral, that Matthew knew and recognized and associated with Abby. Abby would play this because she was a deeply committed Christian. She's the one that loved Francis Quarles, and Francis Quarles' poetry, if you read it, is very otherworldly. He's very much the renunciate. You know, it's very austere poetry. He's only concerned about God and heaven. He's not concerned at all about this world. He says this world is a liar and a cheat, see? Well, Abby was of that kind of religion, very strongly the renunciate, and she was very concerned about heaven. Well, that's a little bit of an error, but that's a long, that's another story. Basically, real mysticism is concerned with God, not so much concerned with heaven. So that was her error. Matthew had his own errors in terms of skepticism. But that was typical of Abby and of Victorians at the time, who were constantly being faced with death, that this life is a veil of tears and the real life that we wait for and look for and yearn for is the life of heaven. So that was one of her favorites. But uh, to Matthew, it meant that she was too ready to leave him, see. So he couldn't, he didn't like it and he couldn't bear it. I mean, he did and he didn't, you know, he was very deeply ambivalent about it. So I'm going to go to the piano and pluck out as much of the uh, soprano part of this tune. I mean, I can play the chords in the right hand, but it would take me time to learn both hands, just to give you an idea what it sounds like, and that'll be the end of this entry. Um, when I talk about Matthew as an abolitionist, when I talk about him being undercover, I'm not just imagining, you know, it sounds that way because, you know, here's the thing. First, I say I know who I was in a past life. And then I said, oh, and in this past life, I wrote these literary classics. I was the real author. You know, I was the co-author of A Christmas Carol, and I was the real author of The Raven. Well, already I've lost people. Already this guy's bonkers, you know. And 
<laughs> and then I say he was a spy. On top of that, he was a he was an anti-slavery spy, see, undercover. And that's why he couldn't come out and defend himself. Well, that sounds totally, you know, wacko, but it's all true. <laughs>